study the power of conditioning, Watson used infants as subjects, as you can see in this original footage from the 1920s. Watson showed that strong emotions could be learned in one situation by conditioning and then generalized, that is, transferred to other similar situations without having to repeat the original conditioning. Watson and his assistant, Rosalie Reyna, conditioned the infants to fear a white rat they had liked at first. In this case, they worked with an eight-month-old called Little Albert. Each time the rat was presented, a loud gong was struck, startling the infant. Soon the appearance of the rat alone was enough to make him cry and become fearful. This was classical conditioning at work. When the child crawled away from the rat towards safety, her behavior was rewarded in that her fear was reduced. Instrumental conditioning was now at work. Later, when the children saw any stimulus that was similar to the rat, a rabbit, a dog, a fur coat, a mask, their learned fear was generalized to all of them. The once fearless children were now easily frightened by a host of harmless things. Watson's pioneering study was controversial because of the way he used children. Such an experiment could not be conducted today because of strict ethical guidelines governing the treatment of all research subjects, humans and animals. A few years after the demonstrations, an associate of Watson, Mary Cover Jones, developed techniques for removing naturally conditioned fears in youngsters. Jones was the first behavior therapist. But these techniques came too late for some of Watson's subjects. Little Albert's fate remains unknown. Another towering figure in the study of learning was Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner. Skinner built upon the ideas of Pavlov, Thorndike, and Watson, and was interested in how behavior is influenced by external events in our lives. For many psychologists, behavior is explained as an effect of internal processes, either mental or neural. For them, behavior is seen as the outward expression of what's going on inside. But Skinner disagrees. His research investigates behavior in terms of its relationship to environmental variables that precede and follow it. You can think of it as psychology's ABCs, antecedents, behavior, consequences. In the early 1940s, Skinner began to examine a simple response of an ordinary animal a pigeon pecking a disc that was followed by a reinforcer, say a food pellet or some water. A reinforcer is anything that increases the rate of responding. The pigeon was kept in a highly controlled environment that has come to be known as a Skinner box. And Skinner's version of instrumental conditioning is known as operant conditioning. Well, operant behavior is behavior which operates upon the environment and produces consequences. And operant conditioning is the change that takes place when those consequences have a particular effect. And we call the effect strengthening or reinforcing. Through operant conditioning, pigeons have been trained to peck at the correct sum of numbers and to perform all kinds of feats. Operant conditioning is one important aspect of learned behavior. But in Skinner's view of psychology, all learned behavior can be stripped down to the relationships between the behavior, its antecedents, and its consequences. He believes that any behavior that is followed by a consequence will change in its rate of occurrence in direct relationship to changes in the consequence. Today, psychologists are pushing the limits of operant conditioning beyond the Skinnerian model. Behavioral psychologist Howard Racklin at the State University of New York looks at ways to enable self-control by using operant conditioning methods. Self-control, like everything else, is a little bit of environment and a little bit of genes, like everything. Self-control is really choosing between a large but delayed reward and a smaller but more immediate reward. 
a larger reward is more abstract and difficult to put your finger on, like good health. Things like good health or even job satisfaction are often the result of long-term behavior in which delayed gratification was consciously chosen. Okay. Racklin looks at how patterns of behavior act as a reinforcement for self-control. Like Skinner, Racklin also uses pigeons to test his ideas. In the first condition, a pigeon chooses between a small, immediate reward and a larger but delayed reward. If it pecks the green button, it gets a small amount of food right away. If it pecks the red button, it has to wait a few seconds, but it gets twice as much food by pressing the red button. Pigeons are very impulsive. Almost 100% of the time, pigeons will go for the smaller, immediate reward. In another condition, we'll say to the pigeon, Instead of pecking the key just once to get that reward, you have to peck the key 15 times. And when we ask the pigeon to, make, to peck the key 15 times to get either reward, it will start pecking on the key leading to the larger reward. So when it only has to peck once, it's right up against the small reward, and it takes the small reward. Whereas when you, if you put the pigeon back, and it has to peck 15 times, it sees the rewards as they are. And seeing the rewards as they are, it starts pecking the key that leads to the larger reward. Racklin demonstrates that following the 15th peck on the green button, the pigeon receives a small but immediate reward of food. The case is different with the red button. After the 15th peck on the red button, the pigeon has to wait an additional four seconds, but the reward is larger. The pigeon chooses the red button, leading to the larger delayed reward, illustrating that a pattern of behavior can reinforce the choices that lead to self-control. The rewards of self-control are very hard to pin down, very hard to isolate, and they're not simply the sum of a bunch of instants. Just like listening to a song is not simply the sum of a bunch of notes. It's a, some abstract relationship. A song is a certain relationship, and that relationship takes time to occur. And these rewards are like songs in that sense. They take time to occur, and they're not simply the sum of a bunch of instants. Racklin believes that recognizing alternatives to a particular behavior helps to change that behavior. For instance, if we want to stop smoking, it is not enough to take away the cigarettes. You need to reinforce the potentially larger but delayed benefits of not smoking, such as experiencing better health, having more money, and increased social approval. The difference between my view and Skinner is that we not only look at the consequences of the specific act that we might want to change, but also the alternatives. We focus on both of those because sometimes the best way to manipulate a certain behavior is not to work on the behavior itself, but to work on the alternatives. Operant conditioning has been applied in several settings beyond the research laboratories where it was first discovered. These are not mechanical devices. These are dogs. That means that they don't always do everything perfectly every time. This promotional film shows a San Diego training program called Canines for Independence. Using behavioral principles, these dogs have learned to assist in the care of disabled patients. Desired behaviors are reinforced by means of operant conditioning until the dog learns a new routine in which a complex sequence of responses are chained together. So I got him to jump up on the table and it took me back to three or four times telling him what I wanted and then he got it and handed it to me and now he just does it all the time it is just one command for him to get to get it now I don't have the to dogs anything. learn to retrieve objects they learn to pull wheelchairs and even push elevator buttons I didn't know it was gonna be like this when I first started but after I went through it 
it's all come true after uh, learning all these commands everything's everything that i've learned you know it's it's working it's all working we've seen some of the ways in which individuals learn how to change their situation but what happens if they learn that nothing makes a difference what happens if they learn to give up entirely can we use conditioning to overcome such learned helplessness fortunately the answer for many distressed people is yes this woman is undergoing behavior therapy for agoraphobia agoraphobia the fear of public places imprisons untold numbers of people mostly women in their homes that's good let's take that deep breath that's good we're going to have one more step the unique feature of this behavior therapy is its pragmatic focus on directly changing the problem behavior the individual's symptoms there's no attempt to find out what caused the behavior only identifying and changing the sources of reinforcement that keep it going in the wrong direction the problem is treated by learning to cope with a fearful emotion and by arranging new positive consequences for the desired behavior so learning can be positive and it can be negative but whatever we learn whether it's the reinforcing consequences of our behavior or the futility of our actions something more than behavior has changed there's also a change in our knowledge and for that knowledge to direct our future actions it must be remembered which means somehow it must be registered in our memory and called into play upon demand learning without memory is impossible memory without learning is useless so next time we'll look at how we remember and why we forget i'm philip zimbardo Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPD to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPD programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org. To learn more about the Annenberg CPB channel series and workshops for teachers, how to take them for credit, how to buy them on video cassette, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org/channel. The Annenberg